Ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to take your seats at this time. Ready to begin? This morning we heard a talk from uh, a noted astronomer about the beauty of the cosmos, about star formation, and about how striking it is to see these magnificent things in, 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 the, in the universe. But perhaps even more striking than that is when you see a man or a woman who has a real humanity. And today, we're uh, very honored to be uh, having eyewitness accounts about the life of such a person, John Paul II, a man who, with the intelligence of his faith and the appeal of his humanity, conquered many hearts for Jesus Christ. And he also left an indelible mark in modern history. So our witnesses today are three men who are themselves quite striking. Uh, we will first hear from Monsignor Lorenzo Albacete, author, theologian, and New York Times Magazine contributor who was a physicist by training. He is the co-founder and has been a professor at the John Paul II Institute in Washington, D.C., and served as president of Catholic University of Puerto Rico in Ponce. Monsignor Albacete is also the author of God at the Ritz, Attraction to Infinity. He is the responsible of the Fraternity of Communion and Liberation in the United States and Canada, and chairman of the Crossroad Cultural Center Board of Advisors. Next, we will hear from Archbishop Dermot Martin, who was appointed titular Archbishop of Glendalough in December of 1998, and received the Episcopal ordination at the hands of Pope John Paul II in St. Peter's Basilica on January 6, 1999. During his service at the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace, Archbishop Martin represented the Holy See at the major United Nations Conference on Social Questions in the 1990s. In March 2001, he was elevated to the dignity of Archbishop and Apostolic Nuncio and undertook responsibilities as permanent observer of the Holy See in Geneva at the United Nations office and specialized agencies and at the World Trade Organization. He succeeded Cardinal Desmond Connell as Archbishop of Dublin on the 26th of April, 2004. And then finally, we'll hear from Christoph Zanussi, a film director. He studied physics at Warsaw University and philosophy. Uh, his films include such classics as Illumination, Camouflage, and A Year of the Quiet Sun, which the American film critic Roger Ebert has lauded as one of the truly great films of the 20th century. Mr. Zanussi is also a theater director who has staged productions all around the globe. Among his many prestigious prizes and distinctions are the David D. Donatello Award, the Cavalier's Cross of the Order of Polonia Restituta, the Chevalier d'Ordre des Arts de les Lettres, the Commander's Cross of the Order of Merit to Lithuania, the Order of Jaroslav the Wise, conferred by the President of Ukraine. He has authored numerous books and is a member of the Pontifical Commission of Culture at the Vatican. Mr. Zanussi made a film about John Paul II from a far country in 1981, and in 1997 he directed Our God's Brother, a film based on the play of the same name by the Pope. And so uh, we're very grateful to these gentlemen for coming today and sharing their experiences with us. I'm on first, right? <laughs> My story begins with cornflake. Thank you. The first time I met the man who was to leave Pope John Paul II, was in 1976, 
<clears throat> when he had come to visit some Polish communities in the United States on his way to the Eucharistic Congress in Philadelphia. And he came to Washington, D.C. with a particular purpose in mind of in asking the Archbishop of Washington for, in, on behalf of the Polish community, for one of the churches in the Archdiocese, so that it could be kind of like a, I guess, a national church. And he was staying at the house of the Archbishop. The Archbishop, however, had meetings out of town and didn't want to leave him alone in the house. So it occurred to him to ask me to help making sure that all the needs of Cardinal Wojtyla were being met while the Cardinal in Washington was away. I said no, of course, <laughs> for two reasons. Uh, I was planning, especially that week, a lovely vacation back home in Puerto Rico, which I deserved. <laughs> And so uh, the Cardinal tried everything. Oh, but you know, the Universal Church, the Church in Poland, the man is an intellectual, a scholar. You love talking with him. Nothing impressed me. <laughs> I can say, look, he's a Polish Cardinal. If he was an Italian Cardinal, there would be a thousand monsignors waiting in line to take care of him because they become popes. But, uh, <laughs> Polish cardinals don't become Pope. So let's get Albacete. Well, so Cardinal said, Well, I see that the only weapon left is to appeal to your materialism and hedonism. <laughs> if you stay here this week, I will pay for your vacation next week. Rent a car and you can stay at the Caribbean Hilton. <laughs> I suddenly developed a great interest in the church. All <laughs> <laughs> true. I take notes. And I make it up. Anyway, so when the moment came, I showed up to, at the house of the Archbishop. And there was Karol Wojtyla, and he was having cornflakes. <laughs> he was not wearing anything distinctive, and not necessarily not as a pope, but not as a cardinal, not as even a priest. It was just an ordinary white shirt and khaki pants. I want to tell you that, therefore, from the very first moment he looked at me and said hello, I felt something that was never going to disappear again. When what was it? I've been trying to think of it, and the best way I can put it is, I experienced the weight of his humanity. I want to underline the word weight, because that is the best I can find. It is, a, it is as a, I felt like, the attraction of when you are swirling around some kind of black hole, as if the reality suddenly went into, the, into this bottomless pit, weighing, uh, I don't know how to explain it, the weight. You, we, but it shouldn't be difficult. We, we have that experience now and then with people. I mean, you, you feel the weight of a particular presence. In fact, that's another word, weight, presence. This was someone who was present. Remember, this was externally a man who was sitting there eating cornflakes. And, and I am trying to describe how that led to this experience of presence and so forth. The word the glory also, doxa, all of these are related to indicate what I felt there. Because look, it's easy, it's easy to put on all the props and come out of the balcony and in front of a million people and give blessings. Well, any Mickey Mouse would be impressive. But this was no props, just his humanity. So he asked me, 
went into the news, I used to be a scientist. He said, so you were a scientist? And I said, yes. And he said, tell me, what is the best language to communicate love? Oh, you know, this is not the kind of breakfast conversation <laughs> that one is used to. But I said, well, uh, what do you mean? And he said, is it science? And I said, well, let me tell you this, uh, Your Excellency, whenever when I was uh, looking for women, I did not send them partial differential equations in two of them. <laughs> and then he said, but what is the, uh, what is the language then? I said, now it's your turn to answer. <laughs> and he said, the language of the theater. The language of poetry, the language of poetic theatrical drama. Again, what, what can you say? I see. And that became almost the one conversation we had when we were talking about in a personal level. I would attend meetings in which I was a member of a group. This having to do with the foundation of the John Paul II Institute in Washington, the first extension of the Institute outside of Rome. And I was privileged to be a part of that group putting it together. And this included meetings with the Holy Father, which were businesslike and professional and fun and everything, but they weren't personal. Whenever I had the opportunity of a personal meeting, we always went back to this original conversation about language, about the theater. In fact, at one point, I said, you know, I'm not surprised that your main philosophical work is called the acting person. Understanding acting in a theatrical way, expressing humanity, giving, giving witness to that weight. I decided, therefore, to have a course at the John Paul II Institute based entirely on his plays. And we would study his social doctrine, his uh, view of love and marriage, all the things he was famous for developing, but not to see them in a play. And he was so excited about that that every time we had a chance for a personal conversation, all he wanted to know is how the plays were being received and what particular phrases, how they, were, how they were meant. Once we were talking about a law which is entirely of the intelligence, there is no, as Father Giussani would say, affectivity, a movement with. And we were talking about that. And in that context, I don't know how I said, your Holy is. Oh, no, I knew he was going to Mexico. And then I said, well, you must love Mexico a lot. You keep going all the time. And he said, yes. And I said, why? Because of Our Lady, I imagine, in a vastly different way, where the rule is the same kind of experience you have in Poland with Our Lady there. And he said, yes, but also because of the music. And I said, like what? He said, well, for example, <laughs> and sang it. Listen. Paloma. Kukurukuku is the sound doves make, or pigeons. No llores, don't cry. Las piedras jamás, paloma, stones will never know anything about love. No saber mi amor, and so forth, and so forth. I have never forgotten that. <laughs> And we had studied the various plays, they were favorite phrases. All of them 
leading, confirming, helping me understand better my initial experience with him. In the jewelry shop, for example, there is this whole question in the very word and idea is use of weight. The weight of the rings. There's a whole discourse on the part of the jeweler about the weight of man. It's, a, it's beautiful. I recommend you look at it. I think I'm running out of time. If anybody wants to understand his social doctrine, his political doctrine, especially in these days, that so many people are confused, should read the play Our God's Brother, which deals with that, which deals about how a person of faith responds to the radical injustice that is often structured in the very society. And there, too, there is a discussion about the weight of man. Weight, weight. And in the most difficult, perhaps, of the plays, the radiation of fatherhood. The word weight doesn't appear as such. But the, the fact that being a father, as he says, means being a son first of the mystery of the father. That fact is an invasion of our desire to be left alone. Or oh, you should read the lines in which Adam, the man, the father in the play, complains about having been given a heart and prefers loneliness, no weight, no co-presence with him. With, and, and there you, you see the great answer, the great line with which I will end. Loneliness, when loneliness intersects suffering, no, when loneliness intersects love, the fruit is suffering. He, capital H, suffered. Thank you. My reflections will be of a different uh, <laughs> category. As one who was, uh, to use the phrase of Pope Benedict, a humble co-worker in the vineyard of the Lord for the entire, almost entire period of Pope John Paul's pontificate. I remember, well, the evening of his election. I was in St. Peter's Square. Only a few months earlier, weeks earlier, I'd been in St. Peter's Square on the evening of the death of Paul VI. The square was empty. Paul VI died in the early days of August, on a balmy, hot summer's evening, in which nearly anyone who was anyone in the Vatican was away on holidays. And it says something about my rank at that stage, that I was of no weight, that I was just there keeping things ticking over. His death was totally unexpected, as I said. And all those who remembered what had to be done when a pope died were away from Rome on holidays. I lived in the Vatican and with an old religious sister there had been in Rome for the death of Popes Pius XI, Pius XII and Pope John XXIII. And she said to me for two full days, when are they going to ring the bells? Because there's a particular toll of the bells in St. Peter's when a pope dies and anyone who knew about it was away from Rome on that balmy August evening and had never heard, the others had never heard of what to do. Then Pope John Paul I was elected. To the surprise of many, he chose that unusual two-bodied name of the past two popes, John Paul. 
two popes who played such an important role in the calling of and the bringing to fulfillment of Vatican II. A unique moment of history, um, in a sense, had come with the death of Paul VI. The two popes of Vatican II had died. And Pope John Paul I clearly wanted to be associated with Vatican II. And with the touch of subtlety which was unique to him, he wanted to show that without any ambiguity that his pontificate would be linked to the extraordinary work of Pope John and Pope Paul and the extraordinary event of the church in the middle of the 20th century, Vatican II. And then to our surprise, Pope John Paul I was called unexpectedly to the Lord and the church seemed once again bereaved and in mourning. And then Cardinal Carol Wojtyła was elected, the first non-Italian pope for centuries. Perhaps also one of the fruits of Vatican II. It was a complete surprise, even though there were some who had been talking about that possibility. There was much speculation at the time. As I said, I was in St. Peter's Square on that evening, and I remember going back into the Vatican and seeing, watching the stunned surprise of Monsignori, the Vatican police and officials who'd gathered inside the gates as it began to dawn on them that the new pope was really Polish, that he really was not an Italian. And it was quite a surprise, and many didn't look at all happy at this and didn't know what it would entail. I tell this story not to stress the fact that there was a surprise and maybe disappointment at the idea of a non-Italian pope, but to be able to say that many years later, on the death of Pope John Paul II, I saw these very same Italian-born Vatican officials in tears, in tears at the death of one who in those intervening years had become for them a true priest, a true friend, and also a great friend of Italy. Pope John Paul II, you see, he captured hearts, he spoke to hearts, and he challenged hearts. Just think of the numbers who attended his funeral. I remember, as I say, the day Pope Paul died, there was no one in St. Peter's Square. The day Pope John Paul died, the square was overflowing. But those numbers, no matter how high they were, represent only a small proportion of those who joined in the morning worldwide. In my diocese, on the morning before his death, as the news about his death and his health became more worrying, I mentioned on a morning radio program that I would be saying the evening mass in the pro-cathedral that day for the dying Pope. There was nothing organized, no invitations, no further publicity, but the cathedral had its biggest attendance in all its history. Most of the faces were not known faces, not public figures, perhaps not even regular mass goers. Many were young. And I'm sure that that spontaneous identification with Pope John Paul was probably worldwide. Pope John Paul II captured hearts. And he captured hearts deep down. Pope John Paul surprised his critics. Only a few months before his death, I was approached by a group of journalists who were preparing the Pope's obituary. I knew that they'd written their pieces much earlier, and occasionally if the post, Pope sneezed, they wanted to update it because they felt they were, they were ready to publish. Most of the obituaries were just the same. A few nice words, then a declaration that really he had lost contact with the church through his conservative positions and now was the time for change. We needed a new pope. It was, as it turned out, really time for change. Not change in the pastoral ministry of Pope John Paul, but change in the obituaries. Pope John Paul II surprised his critics by showing them something that was quite unique in our modern society and struck even the toughest journalist. Pope John Paul showed them and showed us how to die. How to die as the culmination of a lesson in how to live. 
In his retreat given in the Vatican to Pope Paul VI, he had a chapter on death, and I read it the evening he died. Um, he, was, he faced death publicly. He said in that book, nobody has, can ever tell us what it's like to die. Nobody is able to do that. And he prepared to live and to, to die publicly in a sense of faith. And any opposition there was to his ministry melted. And the few who kept up their discontent with his pontificate were left singing very much out of tune. Pope John Paul II captured hearts because his own heart was open and caring and daring. Think of the huge crowds who came to World Youth Days. Think of the small group who came every morning to attend his daily morning mass. I think of the support he brought in private to bishops and church leaders where the church was suffering persecution. He was for them truly Peter, rock, one who confirmed his brothers and sisters. Pope John Paul knew the church and loved the church. I remember the final time I spoke to him as I, he was sending me back to Dublin as Archbishop in Dublin when he spoke about his love for Ireland. John Paul, the saint, is part of our title. The old bishop who ordained me used to repeat to me when I'd say to him, I'm not really holy enough to be a priest. He said, young man, holiness is not an emotion. Holiness is in the will. Holiness is in the daily manner in which you respond to the challenges that our faith and our calling brings. Holiness is not our doing. God loved us first, but our response constitutes our holiness. It's about a synergy between what we are called to be and how we live that calling. And Pope John, for Pope John Paul, the motto of his pontificate was totus tuus. He gave himself completely. Anyone who knew him even superficially realized that being a man, being a man and being holy were deeply intertwined. But one had only to see him in prayer to realize how deeply his entire life was bound with Christ and how his mission was to bring that message of Jesus Christ wherever he could. People who traveled with me told him that when he'd land, for example, before going out to address maybe a million people in the stadium, he'd land in the helicopter, the headphones on, saying the rosary. And then somebody would tip him on the shoulder, put the rosary back in his pocket, and without a thought, st stepped out. There was no brushing his hair, no looking in the mirror, no getting, no, no getting prepared, just he came out from prayer. I remember on another occasion at a quite important meeting, um, um, one of the cardinals who was at the meeting spoke for a very long time, and people were wondering what the Pope would say when, uh, when he'd finished, because he had been uh, uh, urging all of us to keep, to, to keep going. And at a certain stage, the Pope's hands came up from the table, and he was saying the rosary. I've never met anyone as tireless in his efforts in reflecting the significance of the person of Jesus uh, for the world we live in. I've never met anybody so tireless in witnessing that. A very simple one that people forget. In the, from the early days of his pontificate, each Sunday afternoon, as people like me in the Vatican, many years longer than, younger than the Pope, would feel justified in relaxing. I saw Pope John Paul go out every Sunday afternoon to visit a Roman parish, something that had never been done by popes before. And he would, he would be back in the late evening after having spent hours in the parish community. Pope John Paul was an extraordinary bishop. His role of being bishop was central to his own identity. Even today, I think there are very few bishops who have shown such dedication that he did. And in a style very typical of his ministry, he thoroughly enjoyed that message of bringing Jesus Christ to every parish in Rome and to any country around the world. And when people talk about how Pope John Paul II changed the world, how he changed the, the map of Europe, it's good to remember that the man who did that was not a politician, not a diplomat, not a military strategist, but a bishop, and he, he, he lived that war, his life out as a bishop. As Father Albacete said, 
Paul VI's writings were about the human person as the active subject, or the acting subject. And I like very much the story of one of his biographers who asked him, Holy Father, how did you feel after you'd been shot? How did you feel in hospital? And he said, you know, my, my writing and my thought is all about being an acting subject. And suddenly I found I was being treated as an object. The doctors would talk about me. They'd decide what they wanted to do. But all I wanted to know was what was actually happening in me, myself. In his life, Pope John Paul demonstrated how it was that in encountering Christ, we encounter our real selves. He dedicated himself totally, placing himself at the disposition of whatever the Lord was asking of him. And this became even more evident as his physical forces weakened. Despite illness, his commitment never waned. He showed the world that one can fully and authentically witness to faith in every stage of one's life's journey, and one should do that. The Pope who taught about the dignity of every human person, from conception to natural death, showed that the dignity was not just in about caring for those who were vulnerable, but about recognizing the subjectivity, the creativity, and the dignity of every, every human life at every moment. Pope John Paul was a very free human being. Everyone who worked closely with him was often surprised by this internal freedom. I remember one very close collaborator who saw him once, twice a week, who said, you never know exactly how the Pope is going to respond to the matters that you bring before him. He had a unique way of looking at reality. Decisions were not just the fruit of reflection on advice and information. All matters were looked on from the aspect of prayer. And many of his speeches were written in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament. Some of his initiatives not just surprised his closer collaborators, but actually scandalized them. I remember the initial reactions to his initiatives for prayer among all the faiths at Assisi or even stronger as his request for an appeal for forgiveness of the past sins of, Christi of Christians, which he launched at the time of the Jubilee. And any time John Paul invited you to discuss something with him, you would always had to go very well prepared, because you never know uh, from what angle he would begin to speak to you. He was deeply prayerful, and many of his decisions about the life of the church were made by him on his knees. His life was a life of holiness, and that holiness gave him another perspective on what life was about. But his holiness wasn't a, simply a dry holiness. One of the unusual experiences I had was to present to the Pope a number of rather radical pop singers, Bono, who you may know of, and some others, uh, who'd come to speak about international debt. Um, it didn't make my, my friendship with the protocol people in the Vatican any better to bring such unorthodox people to him. And I had my list and I was told exactly how to manage things. And um, Bono was to give him uh, a book of poems by an Irish poet. And just as I was about to explain what it was about, Bono took off his, what I later, later learned were called shades, and gave them to the Pope. And the Pope put them on and looked around the room quite uh, uh, amusingly and kept them as well. <laughs> and um, Bono himself said to me, it's the, the one photograph I really would like to have. Um, but uh, the Pope's minders were very quick to say that photograph is not to be published <laughs> until he died. But it was again typical of this man. Uh, and it completely disarmed many of those who came expecting to meet a very different type of Pope. There were many caricatures of Pope John Paul. Progressives and conservatives were happy to acclaim him as one of their own if they agreed with him. But Pope John Paul could not be put into simple categories. I remember in the mid-1990s as I was part of a group who represented the Holy See and a series of international questions at the United Nations on social development and social progress in the world. First thing that must be said about John Paul 
is that even though these, contra- these conferences were very controversial, he recognised that they represented a genuine search in the community of nations to develop policies for authentic human development. He was clearly aware of the opportunities for good that these conferences represented, just as he was aware of how they could damage elemental dimensions of being human if they lost contact with the fundamental nature of the human person and of the human community. On many occasions, he repeated to me, in your interaction at these conferences, I want you to support every element that is positive in their programs, but also to denounce, even clamorously, since anche clamorosamente, what is not in the long-term interest of, human, of the human community. Support what is good, denounce what is, is not in the long-term interest. But then he would add, you must do both. He reminded me that it's easy to be superficially supportive of uncritical ideas and win the applause of the media. And he said, it's also easy to criticize and then run away. Finding the way of doing both was the critical challenge. That was not just a critical challenge for a delegate of the Holy See at an international conference. It's the challenge of every Christian, lay and religious, in the world in which we live. Support and win uh, agreement with others for what is good. Denounce what is not good, but do both. The final thing I say is that Pope John Paul was a man who showed extraordinary gratitude to anybody who did even the smallest thing for him. Uh, And that, again, was a wonderful characteristic uh, of this man, who always had time to remember even those who did the smallest favour for him. For him, there was no distinction between powerful and being a humble co-worker in the vineyard of the Lord. Holiness in John Paul was linked with where I started off, with John and Paul, the Vatican Council, which he saw as the charter for the way forward for the church, and a charter we still had to develop and live into. And I think if we remember him, want to remember him well, we should commit ourselves uh, to that mission. I thank you. John Paul's manner of living his humanity and thus displaying his sanctity cannot be separated from the culture, the area, the, the, the identity of the reality into which he was born and in which he grew up. That's what you will show us now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I wonder if I would be able to face such a challenge. But I will do my best. And in fact, if I'm boring, don't worry, I will be showing fragments of the films. That's always better. (laughs) But, um, well, I met future John Paul II, and at that time, Bishop Wojtyla, at 59, so many years ago, most of you probably haven't been born at that time. And I met him because he attended dinner at the house of my university colleague, a student. And I was amazed that being the most unimportant person by the table, I attracted so much attention of the bishop because he was always very curious of all people and he was always asking questions. And for the moment when he was talking to you, he was seeing you and not anything else. That was an incredible gift or incredible technique. But later on, when I was learning at the university about personalism, I realized this is philosophy applied to life. And my last meeting with John Paul II, I think it was 2002 in winter, I brought a group of people from Poland. We have a foundation that promotes a meeting or rather a clash between high culture and pop culture and bringing some activists of our foundation, I brought, I wanted to present 
the people who are bra dancing break dance on the street. The Vatican was not very much in favor of this initiative. And I wrote a personal letter to the Pope saying, these people can be seen on all the pavements of the big capitals of Europe, but from the windows of the Apostolic Palace, you may not see them. Immediately I got an answer, yes, bring them. We were in 57 televisions of the, on the, of the world in prime news, because this day, fortunately, there was no earthquake and no, 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 no military clash, but no television transmitted these few words that the Pope has said to the b-boys, to the breakdancers. He asked them a question, and at the time he was half paradise. He was on the wheelchair, and he asked them, why do you do it? If your real aim is pure beauty of these movements, you're an artist. And if you do it for money, or if you do it in order to be famous, your art is already impure, it is infected. You have to act for the sheer beauty. And this notion of sheer beauty as a part of truth and goodness was something I recognized many times in his sermons. And I'm very happy that my distinguished predecessor here on the stage re reminded of theater. And I would like to focus on the link between theater and the Pope. He was brought up in theater, but this theater has totally different meaning. It must not be confused with Broadway or any kind of light entertainment. Theater for us Poles during the World War II was, was a way of surviving, a reference to the natural, national culture forbidden by the Nazis was a very important reference. And this kind of theater Wojtyla was in as a promising actor and also promising play, playwright. And that's what he was planning for his future. And when you see that shrine and theater started in antique Greece, they started together. Later on, they split. But there is something sacred in the theater and there is something theatrical in the church. And I think it is interesting to watch it. So when I was making a film, a biography, biography of John Paul II, at the beginning of his pontificate, so my main problem was how to present him to the world. I thought I should start with him as a boy, as a child, as he participated in passion play Via Crucis, that was performed in the vicinity of Krakow, and especially of, in the vicinity of, of the place he were, where he was born, Vadovice. I reconstructed this play, and I wanted you now to watch a little fragment, a couple of minutes of this film, because you may notice what it has in common, theater and liturgy. It is via crucis, but actors, local peasants, are performing figures from the, from, the, from the Bible. But the public is not watching. The public is participating. And participation is already the same kind of act that we have during the Holy Mass. We participate, we don't watch. Look, when Christ falls, under the weight of the cross. All the participants go on their knees. So they may, they act as participants, not as the public. Public is comfortably sitting in their seats and doesn't move. And I think this was the starting point of something which was very present in life of John Paul II. This junctum, this junction between this contact he, he was finding between goodness and beauty and the need of beauty for human development, for human balance, for human inspiration. So I would like to, you to watch this little fragment, as we have short time, 
I will tell you how it ends, because we won't go that far. This little sequence ends that a long, young boy, Carol Ritua, gets lost in the, cr in the crowd, which is, is an invented story. We don't know. He was there, but we don't know if he got lost or not. And then, after the performance, he goes to the inn where his father finds him, and he watches the actor who played Christ. An actor is drinking beer, and he, as a boy of six, is asking father, why does Christ drink beer? It is the first perception of theater and reality, which are sometimes in counterposition. May we go with the screening now? I think somebody is sitting by the computer. Music, but we need something more. Oh, it's over there. Thank you very much for the screening. If you may prepare the second disc, and I will tell you something about how much for the Pope the choice between his vocation as a writer, as an artist, 
and his vocation as a priest was a problem at the beginning of his, of his life when he decided to be a priest. And he reflected it in one of his early plays. He wrote only a few stage plays, and this one was completed in the 40s, so it was something like 46, 47. He was a very young man by that time. And he wrote a play about somebody who was already, who was a real person, you will see it from the film, but the dilemma he was confronted with was his own, was Vitiva's dilemma, art or priesthood, consecrated life or life of an artist. And he wrote a play which was called Our God's Brother. This play was never performed when under, well, under communist rule it was allowed for the first time when he was elected the Pope. But also Catholics rejected it simply because he was an unknown priest and the theme was very ambitious. He introduced incredible characters to his play because even the leader of the communist revolution, Lenin, is present in his play and he wrote dialogue for him. So it was too revolutionary for 1938, 1949, and this play was totally remained unknown for many years. Now when we find, find some moments in this play, we realize it was very prophetic. He knew many things, he wrote about things that later on were recognized as great problems of humanity. So now, let me tell you something about the <clears throat> next fragment I will show you, which is the beginning of our God's brother. It is the part where I edit at the beginning some explanation, but it's also an explanation which I would give from stage, so it is better done by an American actor who is on screen. And it explains this dilemma, what could you serve to masters? And Wojtyla made a very clear-cut decision. No, if I am a priest, this is my first, first vocation. However, even in most difficult moments of his life, after he has written so many encyclicas, suddenly he came back and became a poet again. And the Roman triptych is a poem because, as he said, there are things which you can express by the language of poetry better than by the language of theology or of encyclicas. And I think he was very right. Art has a particular power that can transmit things that other means of communication are unable to transmit. So we should take art as something more important than just share entertainment. There is something very important as a, as a goal that art may achieve. And now, a few little things, because it will be a longer fragment. It will be like seven, eight minutes, I guess, if I remember correctly. There is one thing I will say I'm proud of, that one of the actors who was appearing in this film two years ago, he was totally unknown Austrian actor whom I've seen in Germany. He was fluent in English, so I took him to my previous film and then to this film. I was telling him that he's, he has a great future, and after 10 years of our collaboration, he said, you are not a good prophet because I'm not getting known at all. And now, two, day, two years ago, because of the film Bastards of the War of Tarantino, he got Oscar, and he is a big star now, Christoph Waltz. But you will see him in his second film role in my film. And there is also one element which I would like to point out, marginal, not very important. It is some violence or cruelty. My protagonist, the protagonist of Wojtyla's play, has lost his leg during the rising against the Russians. And it was amputated on the camp, on the field. And they shot this film, and I did the scene very realistically. So later on, I had some doubts. And when I've shown the film to the Pope, I've asked him if he's not shocked by the realism or by the naturalism of the scene. Well, he said, it is your problem, but he said, too, life is cruel, and there is suffering in life. 
So when you remember Mel Gibson, or Mel Gibson, passion, it was also very often criticized that it is too cruel. But the Christ's passion was cruel. So maybe for the sensitivity of today's man, it has to be shown in a very cruel way. And there is a third element which I will reveal just to conclude. The third person who will be on the screen is presenting a character who indirectly reminds of something of real life. It is commonly believed among the friends that Karol Wojtyla as a student, before thinking of becoming a priest, he was very interested in one of the very beautiful ladies who was with him in this acting group. But this lady has shown interest to another man. And allegedly, because I'm sure it is invented, when she was, had to decide who is closer to her heart, she said to Wojtyla, you know, physical beauty is very important, but I look for a spirit, and she has chosen, and not a very good writer. Anyway, this is the story, which is alleged, probably not true. But let you see now the, this fragment, the beginning of Our God's Brother. with the credits, it's not that I want you to learn my name by heart too late, but uh, I thought it is the whole introduction which has to be shown from the theater's point of view. The play which you're about to see was written in the late 1940s. The playwright, Carol Wojtyla, who later became Pope, Pope John Paul II. 
The play is about a real person, Adam Miralowski, a successful, gifted artist who gave it all up. Took the name Brother Albert and became a monk. In his memoirs, Pope John Paul II writes, for me, Brother Albert was particularly important because I found in him a real spiritual support, an example in leaving behind the world of art, literature, and the theater, and in making the radical choice of a vocation to the priesthood. As a young priest, I wrote a dramatic work in his honor entitled, The Brother of Our God. This was my way of repaying a debt of gratitude to him. In his early years, Adam took part in the 1863 uprising against the Russian occupation of Poland. An incident which occurred during battle affected him physically the rest of his life. It left him lame. This is how our character, Adam Bielowski, describes that event. I wasn't aware of the danger. How long did it last? I don't know. The Russians, tired of shooting, finally stopped. I was becoming bored, wondering when someone would come up to fetch me. How much longer would God's patience bear human stupidity? I outpaced death, but I saw beautiful images only. I had no thoughts of eternity or my soul. I only thought about the poetic and heroic side of the thing. assess the real value of things. She considered the redemption of my soul. It was with joy that I welcomed the idea of calling for a priest. Immediately, I imagined how beautiful that was going to be, a dying insurgent and an old capuchin with a long white beard. How beautiful I deemed it. An indecently obese man appeared, his massive figure not in the least soulful was so distant from what I had imagined that I didn't want to confess or even to speak to him. We imagined how difficult it was to cuss this man because he knew the script. I believe that Max, and this is Chris Carlson, Voitiwa's drama, is based 
on the painter Maximilian Gierimski. He was even more talented than Adam Chmielowski, and both were outstanding artists, though. For a time, they studied together in Munich. The writer of the play often consciously distorted the chronology of events, so the following monologue may have been spoken there. Can one serve art and God both at the same time? Christ says you cannot have two masters. I believe that serving art is always adulterous, unless you do it like Fra Angelico, devoting your art, your talent, and your thoughts to the glory of God, painting only what is sacred. But to be like him, one must be purified. One must make oneself sacred by joining a monastery. <laughs> Because in this world it is so very difficult to find inspiration for such great subjects. Ah. Nonetheless, in time one finds one's way and purpose in life. In Voitua's play, there's the character of Helena. Evidently, Helena Modzewska. One of the most gifted actresses of the 19th century, a rival to Sarah Bernard. In her memoirs, Helena devotes much space to Adam Chmielowski. To young painters, our house was a place where they could discuss art and life with eminent figures, well-known scientists, and writers. Adam Chmielowski not only possessed all the Christian virtues, but was also a devoted patriot. His soul was pure. He believed in happiness for everyone, in the glory of God, and the glory of art. Another witness of the time, Maria Morstin Górska, remembers. Adam, like his two friends, was in love with Helena. But in his heart, the admiration he had for her might have had deeper roots. Modrzewska had only friendship for him. Chmielowski never talked about his feeling for her, but we know from his memoirs that despair was ravaging his soul. Ten seconds to cast. Thank you very much for the screening, and thank you very much for listening to me. I think if we remember John Paul II, as a great pope, as a great priest, as a great man who got beatified. Let us remember also that he was a very interesting artist and he understood that art is also one of the ways to God. Thank you. Some questions, but we've gone over time, and he'll throw us out before. When the Pope died, John Paul II, I was spent most of my day at CNN, commenting, asking their questions in every conceivable talk show you can imagine, and news in Spanish and in English. And the reason they asked me was because they were very, very astounded by what I said to the first one of them the night he died. And I said, to me, this has been the greatest moment of his performance, of his acting, in the sense that we have seen it so well described. And then within the drama of life in the church, as the Archbishop explained, it all comes together in a free man who is able to freely act so understanding act this way and performance this way, I want to finish by saying, Carol, you put on a great, great show. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well,
Well, uh, Archbishop Martin, Maestro Zanussi, Monsignor Amosetti, thank you. Uh, if there's a theme for uh, this afternoon, perhaps it's uh, that uh, a new humanity uh, changes us. It generates something new in us. Uh, this is the Christian method. And uh, so at uh, our next event will be at, at 4 o'clock. Uh, Monsignor Abbasetti will be taking an encore performance because he'll be introducing a uh, film, uh, Monsignor Luigi Sani, a priest wounded by beauty. It's a documentary about the life of the founder of Communion Liberation, a man who, whose humanity also has changed many people and generated an, a new life. And so this presentation will be followed at 5.30 by the discussion about new challenges in education today the ideals and struggles of the online generation with Christopher Bassage, Ross Douthat, and Matthew Kaminsky. Um, so I invite you to uh, be here at four o'clock now for, uh, for uh, the next presentation. And I just, a quick reminder that uh, there is a, an area at the second floor, in the center of the floor, a new area, area called at the heart of the encounter where you can meet uh, people from the Community Liberation Movement who have uh, organ helped organize this event, uh, learn about the life of the movement, life of Father Jassani. And also that uh, the New York Encounter is made possible by volunteers and by donations. And there's a possibility of making donations to the New York Encounter in, in the lobby. Okay, so thank you. We'll see you at 4 o'clock.